Hello everyone, we are back after a brief break. <clears throat> Welcome back, first of all. Uh, and we are looking at our first collegiate match of the season. Now it is, of course, the preseason still. Uh, but it is going to be between two teams. Uh, one of which has had a fantastic season. I believe they are the they're the defending champs, are they not? Yeah? They are, in fact, yeah. the reigning champions. And uh, another team that is a brand new team to the collegiate uh, collegiate side of things. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about these two teams here, Bamilf? Would be my pleasure. So on the one hand, we have UCSD. We have the Tritons. We have the eventual champions, or the previous champions, however you want to talk about it, for the CEA fall-winter uh, season. They played a great series. They had their Uber Ace in Vindicta. That was able to just get all the maps they needed, but of course it was a team effort. They had they played some great two v twos. It was really an exciting playoffs run for them. But now it's a new season, and they got to play more people. And we have, when we talk about this being a new season, this is the biggest season that CEA has ever had. They had about thirty percent uh, more teams this year than they did last year across all games. So that's already exciting, and that means we have a couple new collegiate StarCraft teams as well. One of these is I, I want to make sure I get this name right. Uh. The Weenie Hut Juniors StarCraft team from George Mason University. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, I got a little bit of an affinity there. I grew up like an hour away from George Mason in uh, like right on the edge of Northern Virginia. So I got that. And of course, well, their captain, he uh, he's on the he's on the team that both Steadfast and I are on. So we got that little bit of conflict of interest there. But don't worry. Of course, the smile of T-Dragon is enough to uh, to balance the odds there. Remove that conflict of interest. But... It's exciting to see these new teams show up. Now, one of the benefits of the CEA is, especially with the Collegiate Division, it is designed so you can play a best of five with only three players. And that is absolutely the case that George Mason has here. They have three players. They have Full Heart, they have Janitor Bob, and they have Iswo, or uh, Isord, I believe, is uh, his NA name. But any or his name on this account. Anyway, so they only have three players. Well, that's fine, of course, because what you do is you have two players play 1v1s, and then different uh, permutations of the three players into 2v2s and it works out just fine so it's a three-player team it all depends on their preparation all very much depends on these three players if someone's missing well it's kind of not a great situation but we're gonna have to see exactly what they do because i know full heart is very good and the other exciting thing steadfast is t dragons actually playing in a game now this is only the preseason so it may not he may only be doing this because it doesn't count but t dragon is playing in a game in a, in the CEA. That is that is groundbreaking here. That is monumental. Uh, we're gonna have to stop the presses. I don't care what's happening anywhere, and we are we we're just gonna have to get every major news outlet covering this one. It is a big deal, and uh, well, we're gonna get to see him uh, go toe to toe versus a fellow Zerg player here, and the map to start things off to make his debut on the season is going to be Pillars of Gold. And, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. You know what? I it, It's funny. People say, yeah, PvP is the best uh, mirror matchup now that, that shield batteries are a thing and you don't just die to proxy robo for the most part. Some people will say that TVT is the best matchup because the, the symphony of positioning is just so incredible. But I would like to humbly put forward that I think ZVZ is by far the best mirror matchup, especially when you get into the late game, when it's Hydro Lurker Viper versus Hydro Lurker Viper, and you just see insanity all over the place. It's certainly one of the most active mirror matchups, and I don't know, maybe I'm just crazy. Um, certainly, certainly the owner of Alpha X seems to think that's the case as I try to say, ah, oh, just give me ZVZ. But anyway, steadfast, <laughs> we're in here. It's game number one. It's on Pilares de Oro. Let's get on into things. <laughs> Yes, it is. And we have spawning down in the bottom left from the Weenie Hut, representing George Mason University, it is Janitor Bob. Rocking that cute little Zergling. And in the upper right, in the blue, looking to have a nice little barbecue here in this game number one from UCSD. He is T-Dragon. T-Dragon, also a member of Alpha X. So very, very cool to see there. We got uh, got Alpha X on one of these teams, Exxon on the other. Uh, a little little very much friendly rivalry between the two squads. A uh, lot of a lot of commingling, I guess. Kind of kind of like uh, cousins almost, in a sense. 
Yeah, it's funny. I think of these two teams as the two biggest North American teams, but then you realize that Alpha X has two Korean players and, you know, half their ownership lives in Southeast Asia. And it's like, well, is this really a North American team? I don't really know, but I think of it. I think of them that as anyways, because, I mean, they got Estrella. And that's all that you need to be the biggest North American team, right? Well, they have Estrella. They have uh, Future, I believe. They have... Masa, Vindicta. even though he retired. Yeah, Vindicta, exactly. They've got Asuna, a really, Starkiller, really... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, they just picked up Trigger, who has all of a sudden shot up like 600 MMR in the last couple of months. <laughs> uh, he's Protoss. You know, I'm not saying anything. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he is. He's actually starting to make a really, really big rise, and I'm, I'm looking forward to see seeing more of uh, more of that. But, yeah, no, a lot of, lot of up-and-coming players. So Alpha X, a very, very... Big squad with uh, definitely an international presence, but also that that North American one as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, Alpha X makes a very big deal about their coaching and preparation abilities. Right, That is something that is one of the things that they really provide for their players going on in, into big matches. And it's something that when Zhou Un made the finals of the GSL Super Tournament, uh, what, two weeks ago, I think, at this point, that was something that got explicitly mentioned as, oh, good catch there, Steadfast. Notice that we do have Janitor Bob here. He is not pulled out of gas mining. And, you know, generally in ZVZ, you, you mine gas a little bit more than you do in the other matchups because you need that quick bailing nest. But generally, it stays until, like, two out of three, like we see T-Dragon doing here. So you can have those defensive bailings, but nothing much more than that because, I mean, you want to get your third base. You want to get further on into things. But there we go. Bailing nest on the way will be faster than T-Dragons because, of course, three out of three instead of two out of two. But we're going to have to see exactly where things do go from here. Because this is only two base play for the moment. Generally, in the ZVZ, you'd have the third base getting started right now if you had players kind of intending to do that. So, we're going to have to see where we go from here. No tech from T-Dragon. Not yet. And notably, he's going up to four queens right now. I would not be surprised if this turns into a Nidus play. Oh, there it is. The fast uh, layer coming down. Ooh, I am I am intrigued. Color me, color me interested. What color is interested, Steadfast? Uh, it's like a peridot. Hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, I actually don't know what color peridot is. Is that is that like a light <laughs> like, purple? I, you know what? I've seen the word and I know it's a stone, but I cannot. It's it's like a bluish. I okay, actually cannot then... put to mind what color that actually is. <laughs> Ooh, nice job from uh. Janitor Bob, he cleared out the Overlord, but these Lings, oh, excellent Ling from uh, T-Dragon. That was, uh, he died, but not in vain. An excellent Zergling getting the scout right there, and that will allow uh, T-Dragon to deal with this. But he is actually going up to Muta, so he's got no Roaches, no Baneling Nest. He is in some trouble right now. Oh my god, the Queens are out of position. Well, now there are three queens here, which are solid defensive force, but not when they are just getting surrounded like that. No transfuses were available, nor were they thrown down here. As these Zerglings, they're just a dominant force. T Dragon's not really reacting to this. Is he does he not have? Yeah, he, T Dragon just lacking a larva. Now we have Zerglings on the way, but more and more Zerglings are going to stream across the map. And this is already, I hesitate to say game ending damage, but realistically, this is already game ending damage. Yes, eventually Zerglings will come on out. Yes, eventually these Zerglings will get most likely cleaned up. But you got to remember, T Dragon. You cut corners to get into meters. You cut corners to get on into, uh, to get meters as fast as possible, as cheaply as possible. Third base now from T-Dragon. It's a little bit late. It, he's not mining from it. He loses 17, 18, 19, 20 workers in a mirror matchup. He's now down 15 workers. And yes, the meters will pop out eventually. And that, mean, uh, that means T-Dragon will have a little bit of map control for the time being. But now Bailings are running on in, and I'm not even convinced that that is going to be enough here. It's actually T-Dragon, he's lacking on the gas. He's only has, he only has enough gas for 1.8 1 mutas, so that's not even going to be all that useful. And now look, the Bailings, they're going to look to track down all of these drones. Will they be successful, though? They absolutely will. Everything explodes, Mike. Okay, only five. There we go. Nine more workers down. GG. Janitor Bob, he takes game one. Well done from Janitor Bob, sweeping up all those drones, taking them down, and... Uh... Yeah, taking his opponent to the cleaners there. And you know what, Steadfast? <laughs> that that re <laughs> that very much has to be kind of an upset. Because uh T Dragon. Well, uh, where is he right now? Yeah, he was uh he was Masters in 2020 season three. I mean very good player. And I think the highest that we saw Janitor Bob go was uh something like Diamond One ish. Yeah. Yeah, Diamond Two, Diamond One oscillating there, so 
nice upset, a nicely prepared build, nice upset from our, uh, what was he, blue? <laughs> from our uh, George Mason Zerg player. And now George Mason, the um, the Weenie Hut Jr. StarCraft team has got a 1-0 lead. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's something I'm not going to get used to saying, but uh, I will <laughs> enjoy it every time. Uh, yeah, and we're going to be getting into game number two here in just a little bit here. What is the matchup here? It is going to be the king of 2v2 for uh, UCSD going up against the conflict of interest from Team Exxon. It is going to be uh, Dradition or Doctor Edition, depending on how you want to say that, versus Full Heart. And it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here. We got another ZVZ. So uh, I hope you brought your uh, your larva, your queens, and uh, all your creep, because it is going to be another big old slugfest between uh, two Zerg players. That it will. I'm excited for the madness. And, uh, you know, steadfast. Have you heard that Full Heart is probably the most handsome Zerg that will play in the CEA this year? The most skillful, the most powerful. Absolutely, without reproach, the most wonderful Zerg player that does exist. And he's really attractive as well. So, is, is, that, is that enough uh, conf Is that enough bias out of the way so we can get into casting this game as unbiased? Have I unloaded my bias uh, onto you now before this game really starts in earnest? <laughs> Well, you've unloaded your bias, but I've got mine. I'm just banking it up. I'm just ready to go <laughs> as we get into this one. And uh, we're gonna, we're just going to see it just going to absolutely ruin the cast. You know, like it's just going to be fawning over him the whole time. Uh, you'll, of course, be impartial, but I'm just going to absolutely ruin it. So uh, we got that to look forward to. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, we have we have seen some great plays from uh, from tradition in the previous season. Uh, he was really an anchor of the 2v2 team for UCSE, and it's going to be really interesting to see if uh, he can translate that into 1v1 or if Full Heart can put his team up 2-0. Uh, what are your predictions going into the second game? You know what? Um, I predict that drones will be made steadfast. I predict that maybe <laughs> we might see some overlords as well and perhaps even some zerglings and some queens. That's my prediction. <laughs> but in terms of this actual game, I do think Full Heart takes it. I think Full Heart is an incredible player. Uh, all bias aside, Full Heart, very good player, uh, has been in GM before. I, he's not GM right now. I don't think his account's ranked. It doesn't really matter. Um, and you know what? It's a longer map. It's it's a it, the map feels longer that we're going on into into Eco Station here. But it as I don't have the thing, so I can't follow your your camera. Uh, we're going on into Eco Station. It's a really interesting map. There are some chokes. Uh, it's a longer rest distance until you knock those chokes off. But you know, we should probably introduce the players before we talk about the map just a little bit. Just a little Absolutely. bit too much. So here we are. Absolutely. Spawning the bottom right for Mr. What is... Oh, come on. I got to get this right. I'm screwing it up. For the Weenie Hut Jr. StarCraft team from George Mason, <laughs> he is full heart. And his opponent spawning up in the top left, representing UCSD, your defending champs. It is Tradition in the pink. Man, I, I'm going to try to say this as much as possible because the name really amuses me. But on the flip side, I'm never going to get it right steadfast. It's going to be so hard. Trying. It's like that one French team that was uh, TKAP. I don't know if he ever said that out loud. It was like mm -hmm. uh, Tota. Coca yeah, yeah. No, you got it. Go for it. Pepite. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Yeah, like I said, we both can say it very easily. It's no problem for either of us. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to bother looking at the clip to rewind and see uh, whether that's the case or not. You can just you can just take me at my word. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know. Um, oh man, I'm, I'm I'm on the well, on the wow. What am I even saying? So actually, this is pretty cool. Let's, let's look at that blockade for a second because I believe with the the blockade with those. Um, I believe this is a unit that actually, or this is a structure that actually does have a little bit more armor to it than your standard uh, structure. That's generally what those force fields mean. So it's going to take a while. And I'm just shooting in the dark because I don't think I've seen a map on Eco Station. I don't think I've seen a game played on Eco Station. I certainly have not played on it. But um, that does mean that, yes, there is a relatively quick rush distance, rush distance natural to natural if these uh, the rocks do go down. But I want to say they have like two or three armor. That's what that force field means. And that means it's going to take a good while to just not on through them. Well, actually, um, actually, all rocks do come equipped with uh, with three armor, which is why Zerglings are so bad against them. 
They are just is, yeah. absolutely garbage against them. I mean, this is true, but I'm, I'm try, I feel like maybe, maybe this is they something maybe that even have more. With, I, I want to say there there are some structures that do have more than your standard amount of armor on rocks. There's something we I think we saw something on Heart of Swarm maps. I don't know whether it's been brought back here. Oh, I anyway, would love it if they I mean, had shields. I think that would actually be super freaking cool, uh, because then all of a sudden, defending them is like a a really really interesting mechanic. I mean, like in Brood War, they have Zerg, uh, Zerg cocoons that are put on the map to, to do uh, similar things. And, you know, you interact with Zergling. Uh, different units interact with cocoons differently. You know, spell damage does a lot more to them because they just have super high armor. Um, but anyway, now we do have Full Heart here. Getting a little active on the map as we do see a more standard expand timing coming in from both players. But yeah, this is a lot of Zerglings from Tradition, actually. Sitting here on 12 Zerglings, but not really showing any aggressive inclinations for the time being, as I say that, while well, he's moving out on the map just a little bit. His Bailing Nest will be done right around the same time that Fullheart's is, but Fullheart, he's got a really, really nice spine positioning coming on in here, so he should be able to defend this. At the very least, he shouldn't take too much damage to his fourth base. There we go, 12 Zerglings are on the way, three Bailings on the way. Absolutely not taking this for anything more or less than it, than it is. But now, these, these Zerglings, of course, they're not gonna be able to get a whole lot, but look, he's gonna uh, soup around, maybe do a little bit of damage, sell it, actually, and get one of these Bailings before they finish morphing, that's always really nice. And Tradition, he's just gonna cancel the second. He says, he says okay, more Zerglings are on the way here, Bailings are on the way, let's save that 25 gas. It's gonna be fine. Uh, yeah, I like that decision. He was already droning out of this, and he actually uh, didn't end up, like you said, making any banelings there. He he made them the two, of course, but one of them got canceled. The other one, he canceled himself. So like you said, he commits a way smaller amount of gas to this. And now that allows him to get his plus one missile, his layer up. Uh, Full Heart does have a decent little gas bank as well. But he could look to get some uh, some counterattack damage done as there's just one mo baneling morphing in with this. And yeah, well... Full Heart, <laughs> Full Heart has been producing Zerglings for just about the last 45 seconds here. So... Now we do actually have, we do have the flood of Zerglings from Tradition. Tradition looking to be totally safe because there are no Banelings on this, on the map here quite yet. And we do have a Roach Warren about halfway done. So when plus one and Roaches are going to be done here, well, that's going to be a pretty good thing for him. Now the Zerglings will fire these Morphing Banelings. Banelings are going to look to make a bit of aggression here. Nice concave oh. for Tradition for the time being, but the Banelings will not connect as they need to. And now the Queen will go down. And these Banelings are going to do such a good job of zoning out the Zerglings for Tradition as he tries to take the engagement that he's looking for. But this is where that MMR differential really comes on into things. Really nice Zergling micro actually from Tradition to make sure he doesn't lose anything more though. One Zergling off on top of those Banelings. And look at this with the Queen Show. This is an old school. You do not see Zerg players do this anymore, said fast, but it's working out here with that spawning pool positioning where you just give your queen a little bit of a hiding hole to go on into when Zerglings run on into the main base. Yeah, that and was uh Oh, sorry, go on. I would say, yeah, you don't see pro players do this anymore. Not really. But uh it's working out there for tradition now. But on the flip side, look at this. Full heart was absolutely droning behind this. He's up nine workers, he was up fifteen. He's in a wonderful position on into the mid game. But go ahead, Steadfast. You were saying something. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, Bullheart droned very, very aggressively behind this. And he recognizes that he may have overdroned even a little bit and built that safety spine at the third base. Now, it isn't going to be needed here as his opponent was droning up as well. But uh, it was a smart decision, I think. And he is just very, very far ahead in this game. The only advantage that uh, Dr. Edition has or Tradition has is the faster plus one missile. But he is not using this to go into a very quick plus two, which is what I would love to see. He's instead going for a quick plus one armor. Now, that will mean that if he if he gets in with a lot of lings, they become more effective against his opponent's roaches. But I, I would really prefer to see that plus two missile. Yeah, no, I was going to say steadfast. I mean, yes, there is a lair done. And yes, we will have roach speed on the way. But do you think this is going to be... There are, there are some all-ins that uh, that Zerg players go for. Generally, they're a little bit earlier. But they are plus one carapace all-ins. They go on with a bunch of Zerglings, a bunch of roaches, maybe some ravagers. And the whole goal is to trade rather effectively. And I was going to say, hey, do you think that Tradition is going to maybe do something a little bit later, but similar along that same idea? But hey, we got a Hydrogen coming down, so... I guess Tradition, he's just going to be happy to sit on his three bases, maybe go into Lurkers quickly. I would like to see him take a fourth because you kind of want those four bases to, to have uh, actually get something done with your, uh, to be able to afford Hydras. But now we have the army of Tradition moving on in and he's down 20 army supplies. So it's a fun idea, but now we're seeing that massive income lead that Fullheart had earlier. It's now really come to fruition here. And well, 
Dirtish is not really going to be able to get anything done here. As he is playing a little bit of a bank as well. It looks like he is larva starved as two queens have just gone down from those uh, that Zergling run by. Yeah, he got uh, a fair bit of damage done there. He picked off seven drones, but uh, he's still behind in that drone count. And as you said, the army supply difference is just massive right now. Uh, very big issue with larva. And I do not see a way to hold off on this attack. This is going to be so challenging. Yeah, all of a sudden, I mean, he gets seven workers, and he was uh, ahead on workers, uh, steadfast, if you can read that. But more importantly here, again, it's a 50 army spell lead. It was a 60 army spell lead at one, some point. These are plus one roaches. Sure, they're against 1-1. One, one. So the quality is marginally on the side of tradition, but the quantity, the quantity is what we got to be looking at in this game. As there are 36 roaches to 12, it is a roach is coming on in a triplicate here, and I don't care how good your upgrades are. You're not winning that fight. So more and more roaches streaming across the map here for full heart as he says, look, I got enough. Nice micro there. He will save all of his low, low HP roaches and turn them into Ravagers, making them even more powerful later on. And there we have Tradition. We'll be forced to tap out GG. George Mason, Weenie Hut Jr. StarCraft team is up to a 2-0 lead. Yeah, great little performance from them so far. Uh, not what I would have expected against the defending champs. Now... As you mentioned, uh, they, they're not necessarily playing their, their lineup to its fullest potential. But this is still a really, really solid showing so far from uh, the GMU Weenie Hut Juniors. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm sorry. I... Uh... Oh, man. No, actually, you know what? Steadfast is funny. I went and looked up the roster. It looks like Vindicta is not on the roster this Ooh. year. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh possible that he's focused a little bit more on maybe his studies in combination with his pro play uh it, it's not a huge commitment of time but it is a, a decent little commitment of time uh to go for this you know week in week out so that that's understandable uh well, but it is very uh that is going to cut into the power level of ucsd a ton well actually i have a confirmation i just reached out to their captain i'm like hey is vindicta playing this year because that's good to know i don't see him on the roster and um, he will be playing Steadfast, but he also won't be playing because Vindicta is just going to be off racing in the CEA this year. Oh, that is very cool. Ooh, that is actually super, super freaking awesome. And I am I am very amped for that. If we can just get him to play random. I guess that he does still have the Terran, so he'll have that super advantageous matchup. But if we can get him to off race, that sounds like... Or if we can get him to uh, to random, that seems like a good bit of fun. Yeah, yeah, I am. Oof. That, that would be very, very cool. Uh, I would love to see that. Uh, but we haven't talked about this upcoming match yet, and it is going to be one of the more interesting things about the corporate side. It is, or sorry, collegiate side. It is going to be a two v two, and well, there are some very interesting things that can happen in two v two, as uh, anyone who has played the match will be able to attest to uh do you know anything about this map polka you know we played uh one I, we played a couple games on this last season i believe it, yeah i think yeah, so that's, that's it looks familiar yeah yeah um so cool things about this map you have a pretty free second base for both players that's that's the first thing you're looking at here is actually this was the map whose uh, map swap was this um, I am not a hundred percent on that. Let me just yeah, uh, so I just yeah, asked. Let me just take. Um, it, it doesn't show in the tool. I don't think so. Ah, uh, fair enough. Okay, so UCSD uh swapped the swapped Poke in here for Arctic Dream, and there are pretty cool things. Uh, a couple pretty cool things about this map. Uh, first and foremost, you kind of get pretty free second bases for both players. That's uh, not something that always happens in 2v2 maps, but this one it is. And your third bases, though, are very exposed. There's a whole large amount of area around the, the kind of ideal third base. And there are only two. And that is countered by the fact that there are only really two entrances into the natural from the ground for, for both of these players. And one of the, or for both of these naturals, and one of them is walled off by rocks. So it's a little bit difficult to get into. When we saw this map played last year, it was a lot of Nidus's, it was a lot of drops, it was a lot of sky toss. Uh, things of that nature. But we're going to have to see what tradition, what food works, what full heart, and what Ice Sword have planned for us here. Because Deadfast, we're now loaded on in to our third game. 
that we are. And uh, it is very, very possible that this could be the last game of the series uh, as we spawn down in the bottom right side of Polka, representing Team Exxon, but more importantly, George Mason University's Weenie Hut. It is Full Heart and his teammate, Isword. Excuse you, it's not George Mason's Weenie Hut. It's the we it's the Weenie Hut Juniors Starcraft team at George Mason. Get it right, Steadfast. Thank you. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> Spawning in the upper left in the purple. He's the 2v2 Maven from UCSD. Give it up for tradition. And of course, last but not least, in the blue, his Terran counterpart. I guess the teal actually. He is Foodworks. And I'm really hoping that that, uh, that spinning logo for his clan tag is actually just his face. Right? That would be really weird if it wasn't, right? Like, <laughs> just putting a random person's <laughs> face up there. I mean, it could be like a streamer that I'm not familiar with that, or a pro player, or, you know, a community member that has this clan that, they, you know, they made their game and whatever. But yeah, as I was talking about, I said, ah, oh, you can burn down rocks to get on in. Not quite true. Apologies. Instead, of course, it is, uh, there, there are minerals that you gotta get through here to get on into the natural easily enough. So it's a little bit interesting of a scenario. Um, I don't think we've ever actually seen anyone actually go mine through those to open up an attack path in the games that I have seen on this map. But I mean, hey, look, we do have a Terran on this map. And well, that means one thing, one thing only. That means that maybe we can see some mules dropped to uh, <laughs> to get on through. I don't think that's what we're gonna see, but it's a fun idea. Uh, something I would actually love to see is, and theoretically any race can do this, I think Protoss and Zerg are best for it, but you could use this ge geyser right here to mine from and then go back and just continue oh. to trade the gas and minerals. Because whenever you have minerals in your hand and you jump into a geyser, it turns into gas, which then goes the other way and means you can mine more minerals. So theoretically, in a very short period of time, you could actually mine through those with just a single worker, or in Zerg's case, two. Because you need to make are, the extractor. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty cool thing, to, a cool idea to talk about. And these are just the kind of things you don't see these you don't see these ideas in one v one maps. It's it's a little too gimmicky. One v one maps at this point in StarCraft's evolution have very specific things. I don't know if you ever taken a look at the map building guidelines. There's like a twenty page uh, document that describes how maps should be that the map makers have gone together and the players have gone together and put together. Said so this is how you build a balanced map. In Legacy of the Void. This is how we put our 10 years of StarCraft experience, 11 years of StarCraft map making experience into this. And it is super in depth. I don't know if you've ever taken a look, but it's like the minerals must be canted this way um, around each mineral line. They, they, they shouldn't be 45 degrees out. They should be a little bit closer. He's got slightly more efficient mining, and that needs to be balanced. Like the smallest of things. Huh. That's. I, that, that makes sense, to be honest. But like, damn, that, that's a lot of. Uh... A lot of details, and I, I do feel that really limits things. Oh, and look at this. We do actually have a uh, full heart going for the mine out here. Uh, but look at this. Foodworks has the Reaper in position, and he blocks the drone from turning into an extractor. Very, very nicely done from the, uh, the Terran player here. So here's my question. Okay, that's just going to be the third base here for full heart. And, or excuse me, from Foodworks. No, from... Who's yeah, the player here? Let's, yeah, yeah, that's full heart. I had, yep. it, I had it right the first time. Okay, there we go. Um, anyway, so that's going to be a rather interesting positioning here from full heart because it's, I, I got to feel like it's a really difficult position to attack on into. But on the flip side, does it really matter? We have Void Rays on the way. We have plus one air on the way here. Did we even get a warp gate? We did. Okay, we got a warp gate, but plus one air, Void Rays, second Stargate, uh, buckle in, steadfast. Void Rays. Void Rays. Make that printer. <laughs> Void Ray Printer go burr. Um, I, it's going to be interesting to see what our players go for here. So we have a lair on the way. Six Banelings on the way here, which is surpri surprising commitment this early on from like no scouted aggression. But look how much damage this Oracle is getting. What is this? Uh, four kills already. And that's already more than you expected it to get. Now this, li now this Liberator will may go on and kill some stuff. Or maybe be able to shoot this off eventually. But not before six, seven workers do go down across the two, uh, across the two teammates. And actually, that's a good question, Steadfast. And I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Is it better to kill like seven workers? Oh no, the Oracle's gonna go down. Oh. Um, is it better to kill seven workers from one player, or four from one and three from the other? Oh, that's a good question. I think seven from one. 
because you debilitate them a lot more so, especially in the early game. Um, oh, these Banelings, they are going to be really important. And actually, just kidding, that was that was Full Heart Slings. That, those were all Full Heart Slings. <laughs> that was just a Scouting Zergling. My god. <laughs> it's so difficult when one Zerg is purple and the other is blue. Oh, yeah. I Oh, man. I, the amount of games I've cast where the players just try to be the, just be really mean to me, and it's like red. Oh, it's even worse. Um, is uh, sometimes If you don't have a mod, if you don't have an Observer mod in there, uh, in 2v2, so these certain Hellions will try to get something done and how many... Five workers, will, five, six workers will go down, but the Banelings and the Zerglings will be enough to clean this on up. There we go. Um, when you don't have a mod in, so we see one different color for each player, when you don't have any sort of a Gameheart mod or Observer Plus mod on the game, one team is red and one team is blue, or whatever color is chosen. And that gets rather annoying when you're like, okay, especially when it's like TT versus EZ or something, like, okay, who's controlling this, right? Because two reds, two, all the Marines are red. You don't really know what's happening here. Anyway, also pink and red, pink and red zerglings just make me want to cry. That's a different story. Oh yeah, there, there's so many combinations that are just so difficult to actually discern. And well, looking at this game right now, looking at the state of things, it does look like Full Heart and I Sword are in a pretty good spot here. Now the one thing I will say is that Void Ray is against Terran, not all that powerful, but they are relatively easy to just pump out and uh, get in. And if you can uh, have your Zerg ally take care of the Terran, and then, oh my god, oh. speaking of taking care of things, these speed banelings running in, getting huge hits. Now, the plus one carapace did help a lot, and uh, Tradition, with the extra reinforcements coming in here and the upgrade lead, is going to be able to, to win out and hold on. But that, those were some huge baneling connections. All right, so we're... This is a really interesting opener coming from Fullheart here because, look, he did get Baneling Speed. He did get a lot of Banelings early, but he's going for 1-1 one, one range. He has a Lurker done on the way. There's a Hive on the way here, so we're going to see some 3-base Hydro Lurker Viper play come on in, coming on in to try to balance out what his... Well, to try to complement and support the Void Ray tech that his opponent is going for because, hey, Steadfast, Marines and Hydras are very much not good against uh okay these void rays need to be microed out of here and it looks like one of one more of them well no okay only one only the one will die but anyway marines hydras they are terrible i mean a banelings eventually is a banelings nest coming down here for tradition are objectively terrible against lurkers especially lurkers with range with plus one with plus two uh with burrow speed all of these fun things so now hydras are on the way here lurker den is just about done we should get, at least see plus two attack on the way sooner rather than later and yes, you have all of, all of these void rays. These have the, these are the units that have been shown to exist on the map. These are the things that Foodworks and Tradition are looking to defend against, right? Are looking to react to. But we have Hydras on the way, and now we're moving on into Carrier Tech behind this because hey, free three bases. That's how you play, right? <laughs> that Ooh, is a four star gate. Very powerful way to play. Yes, uh, you can either go for the. Uh, the flux veins on the void rays, or you can go straight up into those carriers. And we do have these void rays coming in on the right side. Now, Isor does need to be careful. That's a lot of Marines, but the Banelings are coming in from the back. Full Heart recognizes maybe this isn't the fight, but he doesn't want to abandon these links. Oh my God, nice uh, Baneling connection on those links. Uh, he does not want to abandon these void rays. Oh my God, Isor, pull them back. Move them. Oh I no, sword, gotta move them. Oh, ho, ho, ho. So many Void Ray is going to go down. Well, actually, only two. But still, a nice pick off there. Well, you know what? I said carriers, but no, it's just four Void Rays at a time, Steadfast. Because that's how you play this game. Absolutely, 100%. Now, the one questionable thing about this is both Full Heart and Ice Sword have gone for very gas-expensive styles. Yeah. Right? Lurkers are expensive. Lurkers are super expensive. For a second, I thought we, uh, I saw Full Heart getting a second hive. And I'm like, what the hell? But no, only the first half here. And we do have Lurker range now done. A bunch of Lurkers now on the way, which means good luck attacking on into that. Yes, there are some tanks that are sieged up, but these Banelings, they will oh. run forward. And they are. Oh. 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 Yeah. Devastating connections on those units. And, uh, well, Full Heart does finish up the rest of his Lurkers, but my God, that was painful. Yeah, that was not all that great. But again, attacking into this is going to be something that is going to be rather difficult. And what are the oracles? There are three oracles on the map here. I think you only need like one, but he's just going to look for the reveal, I guess. And now we have carriers on the way. Also, as nothing much is happening right now. Oh, the oracles are going to turn their beams on and they actually fight against hydras pretty well. So now we have a full on surround here for the hydras. They will be able to fight against these borderies pretty decently. Four more carriers are on the way though. 
but what I was trying to say before I was so rudely interrupted by the game happening <laughs> is this is a pretty cool map. This map, and it's something I'd forgotten about until we got into it here, but this is one of the rare maps that actually has a day-night cycle. At around 9 minutes and 40 seconds, we saw it here. Polka, the lights turned on. We get to see everything in a different color. Everything's brighter. Everything's more exciting. And I'd forgotten about this, but it's pretty cool. And oh, no, Tradition, he is going for Ultras. Against Lurkers and against Void Rays. Um... I don't agree with that, but anyway, it looks like this uh, orbital, the, the, the SCVs are just going to run away, so they will not get the repair off, and hey, there's a dead orbital, and a second oh. one, right for the picking as well. Hey, the double kill right there. Meanwhile, well, big attack coming in on, I mean, kill and cancel, yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big attack coming in here, though, from uh, Tradition, and the, the Void Rays alone are not going to be able to deal with this. Fullheart needs to get down there and defend his ally as soon as possible. But now we have the Lurker Burrow. Look at everything. It's just going to explode. So, yeah, you know, having that defense is nice. But there's no detection. There's no detection. Board rays are coming on home. And the Hydras, they're just running away. And when the Hydras run away, they don't fight. So, yes, this is a bigger army supply for uh, tradition. For food works at 200 supply all of a sudden. And, yes, that is terrifying. But the longer this lasts, Fullheart, I mean, he has how many? He has 11 Lurkers. They do have... Plus two, they will have plus three eventually, although he has not started that yet as he wants to make sure he spends his gas on, you know, useful attacking units. Oh no, so many of those uh, medevacs will go down here. And this is just Marine Tank. This is not a late game composition. This is not a long-term composition for our Terran players. Now we do have Full Heart. He's gonna run on in here. And of course, these are Lurkers on crack. They get in really quickly. And we're gonna see how many tanks go down before anything. Looks like most of them will. And the carriers are killing everything as well. Yes, there are some tanks in the background, but Foodwork's taking a horrendous fight. Now, we do need to see some Vipers. That is something that we do not see out of Full Heart yet, but something that we will need to see here. And say yeah, these that... tanks, they will continue to be problematic until that happens. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that was an explosive fight, and uh, Full Heart kind of, for the most part, fighting on his own, but trading quite effectively uh, and allowing his opponent to get up more and more of these carriers. Now, the one thing I would love to see is Full Heart actually going up into the 3-3 for his... Uh, his Lurkers and Hydras. We do have Tradition going up into that, which means he is going to be able to theoretically outfight his opponent's units. But uh, so far, it does seem like... Well, there's a little bit of a hidden base here from uh, Foodworks on the left side. And yeah, what a, what a weird and complicated game this is turning into. I mean, hey, this, hour, this is just how things go. So Tradition does have Vipers. Tradition does have Lurkers. He will have plus three done. And, uh, oh, these Vipers will show up, get a really nice blinding cloud on top of a lot of these Lurkers, forcing the retreat here from Fullheart. Not taking the best fight, but now, hey, you know, it's, well, there's going to be another one, and nice abducts. Now, uh, once again, the blinding cloud is going to be rather powerful. How many Lurkers on the map do we have left? Only one Lurker left on the map here for our blue pro, uh, our blue Zerg player. So that's going to be a little bit of an issue, especially now that we do have the, he's fighting two on one. So, yeah, Lurkers are powerful. Yeah, Hydras are kind of, do. I mean, they're two, two Hydras. They can fight well enough. But will they be able to fight well enough to actually defend this? The base will go down, but now the Hydras have arrived, or excuse me, the Carriers have arrived. And yeah, Hydras are powerful, but I'm not sure they're powerful against that many Carriers. That many Carriers that only have plus one. I would like to see some additional upgrades on in there. But, I mean, this is 60 Interceptors on the map, even after that fight happens. Tradition, he's just going to be wiped from the map, as will Foodworks. Uh, yeah, and that was an expensive, expensive fight. Uh, and Isord retains... I don't think he's lost a carrier at, in this game. No, he is not. Uh, did lose 51 Interceptors there, but keeping all those carriers alive is very, very important. Now, something that's really, really important to note is, and you did touch on it, the upgrades for these carriers. They're terrible. They're only plus one carriers, <laughs> and we, during that fight, we had plus three Carapace Hydras. Now, they still lost the fight, but they fought a lot more efficiently than they should have. And, and while well, speaking of uh, plays coming. Oh my god, some weird, uh, weird pickup micro coming in from Foodworks, but he will manage to get everything in the medevacs there. Uh, but Foodworks is gonna lose probably all of this army. But the question is, how much damage can he get in exchange? He's already gotten one base, it looks like he's trying to get another. Meanwhile, Fullheart on the upper right hand side of the map is killing off that, uh, that upper right hand side base of Tradition, so that's gonna be a nice trade for him, getting a bunch of, uh, workers as well. And it looks like Foodworks will eventually have this drop get cleaned up here. <laughs> The one Marauder has its own, uh, has three personal healers. So, uh, it's going to take a while for that Marauder to go down, but it will go down nonetheless. And now Ice Ward, uh, he's only at 44, 45 works, but he has 14 carriers 
He has a mothership. He has a bunch of void rays. He has 111 interceptors. And yes, he does not have plus two attack, and I really would like to see that because, of course, the way this works, interceptors, they attack really fast. Any into any unit that attacks really fast, they benefit tremendously from attack upgrades because it's, a, it's like one, two, three additional damage per shot. And when you fire a lot, you just fire a lot. But now we have the Golden Armada here on the left-hand side of the map as uh, Fullheart just kind of left to his own devices looking to dominate the Zerg on the right-hand side. So this base will go down. The trick, though, is will Fullheart, will I sort of ever actually find this base on the left-hand side? Now, these Vikings show up and they just die. Not all that useful. Is uh, Well, there's no detection here. And it looks like this base may go down once again. Carriers uh, coming, about, coming on in to reinforce, but they're just going to uh, kill off the rest of these Vikings. This base will go down as well. Nice Widow Mines, actually. They're a pretty cool idea to get rid of a lot of these Interceptors rather quickly. But now, okay, the Marines, are they going to... They're not stimming on top. They need to stim on top of this army because right now it's just the Carriers uh, shredding them. But now we do have a lot of anti here, a lot of Corruptors, a lot of, uh, lot of Thors. And we're going to see stuff go down, I think. I don't know. I'm, I'm lagging out here with everything happening. But really, really, oh yeah, we're seeing the loco maneuver. There are no intercept. There are very few interceptors left on the map here, as of course we have the corruptors with the vipers with the parasitic bomb on top of things, just killing off everything. Yeah, so these carriers that, actually should have to get recalled. Uh, they should have been recalled a while ago, actually. I sort is losing everything right here. Meanwhile, Fullheart is getting kind of beaten back on the right side. He did kill off at least I think two bases, which is good. But uh, tradition is slowly but surely pushing him away. Now, oh man, Isor, just get out of there. Those are so expensive, but he's not doing anything and he's gonna lose so many units on the retreat. Finally, the recall comes down, only gonna save two of these carriers. This one in the back may escape, but oh my God, what an expensive, expensive fight that was. And You're important to note, Foodworks did not have this base on the left side ever discovered until just now. You want to see, you know what funny stat though? If you look at resources lost, I, yes, uh, actually, Full Heart and I are pretty far behind oh, in terms of. Oh! <laughs> the poor Hydras! Oh my god! Were they, were they, were those hold position lurkers or did he just run into them? I, I didn't he see. He just it. ran into them, he didn't have detection. <gasps> oh no. Anyway, um, Full Heart and I were rather behind. Oh, look at that scan. Well, great, great display of synergy there. Uh, from the two players, and all the lurkers do go down. Again, this is 2-2 versus 3-3. So this base from uh, Full Heart, from Tradition will be kept alive here. But anyway, Full Heart and Ice Sword, they were pretty far behind from a resources loss perspective for the majority of this game. But after those last trades, it's it's 49k lost versus 50k lost. The, the resources lost differential here is actually damn close in this game. So now we got to look at how much has been mined, how many bases have been taken, and how many bases have been killed. Because that's really the important thing here, is I cannot tell you uh, respective income rates over time. It's it's a 2v2 that's not supported, unfortunately. But more carriers are on the way. I We only have... These are only 1-1 one, one carriers. No, the Vikings are going to find them. All these carriers are just going to go down. No! That is, uh, oh! Oh, jeez. Well, actually, some of them will survive. But uh, now we do have the tradition of fighting full heart on the middle of the map as well. It looks like that fight is... Uh, Ending. There we go. No. <laughs> False alarm. I mean, there was a fight, but by the time you found it, it was it was, it was done. So, you know, all the carriers are going to go down. There are so many Vikings on the map here. And, you know, I hate to say it that fast, but I think we're hitting that. I think we've hit that inflection point. I think we're hitting the point where Tradition or, and Full Heart can no longer be fought. by Or Tradition and Food Works can no longer be fought by Full Heart and Ice Sword. It was a great game. It was a long game, but losing too many carriers. Now, Full Heart will find this base. He is at 145 supply. So, he is still a scary Protoss or a scary Zerg army. But I cannot help but think how much better he would have been in this game if he had just bought a Viper, bought three Vipers, bought four Vipers, done all that. Yeah, it would have uh, it would have really, really increased the power of his army. Uh, but more importantly, if Isord could have gotten the upgrades that he needed and could have retained those carriers, I think, actually, even just the upgrades alone. Now, hold that thought. We are going to see probably the last fight here as Fullheart comes home to try and defend his ally. Uh, he will take a decent trade against his opponent's Hydras, but uh, th like you said, there's just so much for the Tradition Food Works combo. And, and ultimately, well, both uh, Tradition and Isord very, very low on supply here. Oh man, that one Lurker from Tradition still has not been picked off, and it is getting so much damage done to this Hydra army. Look at those spines uh, miss at the end, but get a lot of damage done. All right, so I, t I took a look here as uh, I pulled things up at the very end of the game, and um, 
for a moment there, Ice Sword had literally no units on the map. Hmm. So that was fun. But full, I mean, Full Hardy's doing a good job of defending this. I mean, they are 2 2 Hydras, but he will lose his Hive. And oh, he's going to be able to get that Lurker. That's nice. So that Lurker caused him so many problems. It will go down. And the last of this Symbio is not going to be enough. GG. We got a game four. What an explosive 2v2 coming in right there. Great stuff out of uh, Tradition and Full Works. Or sorry, not Full Works? Food Works. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> dude. Friendship, friendship will 1v1 ended. 2v2 is my best friend now. It's so much fun to watch. It is such it, a chaotic and crazy match. I just really wish that StarCraft was better optimized because I got a pretty good uh, CPU, especially in context of when StarCraft was made. And uh, I just <laughs> get five FPS in those big fights because it's only running on one core, you know. I do acknowledge I need to upgrade, but I, I got... I got a I got the top of the line CPU five years after StarCraft was published. So you'd think that would be good enough, but not in two V two. And now we go onwards. Game four. I don't know whether it's gonna be swapped out or not, but it's either going to be hexagon or hexa hexagon, as in hexa go away, uh, or Emerald City. We have to see what we got there. Yeah, it's gonna be uh it's gonna be hard to tell. Uh, unfortunate for, uh, the George Mason University that, uh, they paired Full Heart, uh, they're obviously their strongest player with Eyesword there, because I think if, uh, if they could have played a little bit tighter with, uh, with the, if they'd maybe thrown out the Full Heart plus, uh, janitor bob combo i think there's a possibility that we see a 3-0 but uh not gonna be the case here as it will be janitor bob and i sword going up against uh who is this gonna be it's gonna be matt fuss and shen jefferson which is uh i assume something to do with the dog i don't uh, so we're, we're we got emerald city loaded up but i think i think the swaps have already been used so i'm checking on in with that um hold on but Anyway, sorry, sorry to cut off your train of thought. <laughs> no worries. Uh, looks like, okay, it's going to be Matt Fuss and is it Tradition? Hmm. Yeah, you are able to, yes, you can swap both. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can swap a 1v1 and a uh, 2v2. Yeah, no, they made it so that theoretically you could swap all four maps if it worked out uh, okay. such that the double bind came through. Intro. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's another rule change. On top of the fact that map the map swaps are now double blind. Players don't. Um. Well, I guess they they, they were functionally double blind. Uh. Last game, right? Or l last season. I mean, you just say, hey, when you submit the lineup, I'm swapping this map, and um, that's how it goes. Because I mean, the players know what the um. Players know what the maps are going to be. They got to be able to prepare for it. So. I don't really think it makes that much of a difference, but the ability to potentially swap all four maps is something that's enticing, something that's enticing, something we will have to track as weeks go on because this map swapping thing is actually pretty cool and it, it's led yeah. to some really interesting metas on just how things happen. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, it's made for some really, really zany stuff and uh, I hope we continue to see that. Now, it is going to be a Zerg Protoss versus a Double Terran team on emerald city here and emerald city is that that's another shared base map uh most maps these days in 2v2 are shared base it's very rare for them to uh to not be but we do see some of those older school maps that uh depending on how the maps get selected could end up having uh a could end up having a situation where it's uh it's it's a split map <clears throat> and yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see uh but we're uh, yeah, getting I'm... into game oh sorry go on oh, yeah i'm at, i'm kind of excited for it emerald city is one of those maps that is just the stalwart one of the stalwart maps of the 2v2 scene it is in like every 2v2 tournament map pool it's been around for forever i don't think it's in the 2v2 map pool currently i'd have to check on that but you know, it, it is one of those just very balanced. It gives you great games again and again and again and again. So I understand why they uh, why they swapped to it, especially I'm looking at the alternative. Hexagon 
that is almost impossible to attack. There's only one way into and out of that natural. That is actually the one of that's a super turtly base. That's kind of interesting. And it, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that kind of meta develops, how the uh, the map swaps develop, because uh, specifically the double blind situations means that you could have both teams uh, want the different map. And that's gonna be that's gonna be cool to see how that shakes down. But let's uh, introduce our players here in the bottom right position. We have representing George Mason University. It is Isword and Janitor Bob. And in the upper left, in the red for UCSD for the Tritons. He is the red turn player. Give it up for Mathis. And of course, his partner in crime, also the Terran player in the blue, he is Foodworks. And uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see here the double Terran team. A uh, lot of creative opportunities that can come out here. Uh, 2v2, a lot of players as Terran love playing mech because, of course, the unit efficiency, the overall unit efficiency is kind of amplified when you have a teammate that can allow you to get up to really really strong compositions uh but then also just the mobility of bio can be really strong as well uh now we saw in the previous game that protoss plus zerg can be pretty effective but i think if we see eyesword go for uh this sky toss once again it's gonna have a significant bigger significantly more difficult time getting rolling as uh mass void ray versus terran and we saw it a little bit there in uh the third game the first 2v2 it is not necessarily all that effective oh nice block coming down from matt fuss gonna be able to uh prevent this nexus from getting thrown down yeah now we do occasionally see stargate styles against terran players in the late game but that is generally more uh carrier to supplement a ground-based force or maybe some tempest if it's a uh really weird it's a lot of battle cruisers or something i think i've seen some tempest styles uh, against terran just as, as a little bit of an add-on there but again you're right here it's going to be a lot more difficult to get into three and four base situations where you have enough gas to really go for that mass sky toss style but you also got to remember steadfast this map is classified as a fortress by the cea for a reason once you can kind of stabilize on your three bases to uh six total bases but three bases per player you kind of have access to the rest of the the rest of the vertical of the map. It's very much in light uh, in light shade, uh, and like light shade in that way, where you have so much high ground that if you defend uh, defend appropriately, well, it's very very difficult for your opponent to get on into things. And we do have a Stargate on the way here for Isor. Now it may just be for some harassment. This may just be how he likes to play every matchup. Who knows? I don't really know. I now I do know in two in the two v two meta, um, Sky Mac or Phoenix Mac is something that is seen as very powerful. But that, of course, that requires TZ. We might see, you know what, actually, what I've seen here, uh, in a couple 2v2 me uh, metas as well, I don't think it's gonna be all that great against a double Terran force, but what you do see occasionally is something like a Phoenix Muta, which is a uh, pretty cool, It, uh, it nothing really fights it in the air all that well. That being said, though, you just get a bunch of Marines and that just kind of dies. So I don't think we're gonna <laughs> see that here. Is that yeah. a second Stargate on the way? Uh, I think that Isord may have just practiced this mass void ray setup and may just be sticking to his guns on this. Well, we'll have to this, see build is a this build is already a little bit different, though, right? Because we do not have a warp gate on the way out. In the previous game, it was warp. Uh, Star Isord did eventually get a uh, Stargate, or did eventually get warp gate, and actually got it at ra rather reasonable timing. But there we go, Oracle on the way. Are we going to see? We're not going to see mass Oracle, are we? There we go. Now we have warp gate, but it's at 346. This is such a late warp gate. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of a, a weird build order coming out of Isword here. Hellions will intercept these lings, gonna uh, prevent them from getting in, but realistically they weren't gonna be able to find too much damage. Now we do have a 2-1-1 coming out of Mathbus, and it is gonna be that mech play coming out of Foodworks here. So kind of alluded to it in the early game here. The there is potential for both of these styles, and it's kind of cool to see uh, the two players adding them together. Oh, nice grab on these uh, Hellions right here. Great move from uh, Janitor Bob. And actually, you know, Steadfast, when we look at mech here, this is actually, I mean, it's cool, but I would like to, I want to point something out here. So when you look at Bioterran for the most part, they mine all this gas and you see like, 
you know, no minerals in the bank, but you see like two key gas in the bank. Because really, what does a Terran really spend uh, in terms of gas? Not a whole lot. But on the flip side, a Meching Terran is absolutely governed by how much gas that they can spend. That you'll see them with massive mineral banks and no gas. Similar idea. So when you have one Terran player playing mech, and one Terran player get playing gas, and one player who needs a lot more minerals than gas, and one player who needs a lot more gas than minerals, suddenly you have this uh, you have this virtuous cycle where, of course, this is 2v2, so players can share their resources. And, well, you have these players that each player is mining into excess of one resource and not the other. So that means together they're mining just enough, theoretically. So that's a pretty mm -hmm. cool little uh, iteration that does, a, that does allow a little bit more efficiency in 2v2 compared to what we see in, in a 1v1 setup. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really important and good point is that uh, being able to take advantage of that is one of the big benefits of having this mech plus bio style is you can oftentimes get a lot done with that. Now, we are going to see this double drop coming down. It's not quite 16 Marines. It's only uh, 12 Marines here, but is going to be able to still jump on top of this... Uh, this setup here and, and well void ray not going to be able to chase that down no marines go down and what was that a a probe or two and uh and that adept yeah not bad and some zerglings yeah non-zero damage once again we do see janitor bob going for plus one melee okay he does have a second evo this time this time so it's not gonna be all that crazy but hey mutiling bane with a bunch of void rays it's not the worst thing I've ever heard of, and actually it's rather interesting. Oh, he's, he's a medevac, so it's just going to go down. That is one thing Vorderers do very, very well um, if they target appropriately and don't just lose them like they're losing all the Void Rays. So that's a rather unfortunate scenario here, and yeah, the, one Void Ray will stay alive, but a, what? Uh, there, there, there's like five Marines that died, about half a drop, and a medevac going down for two Void Rays. Um... Yeah, absolutely. Foodworks is going to take that. He's going to take that straight. He's going to love that trade. And now he's... We got Foodworks. He's at 100 supply of mech. This is where things get a little bit difficult because now Blue Flame is done. It's a lot of battle mech. And it's just Mutiling Bane. Or it's just Sling Bane. And there is no Baneley speed. It has not even been started yet. So this is, this is going to be a difficult fight for uh, Janitor Bob to take in the coming moments. As look at everything just kind of fall apart. Yeah, this, uh, these Blue Flame Hellions are going to have an absolute fantastic time against his opponent's units. And the Void Rays, if they get locked onto, those are Magfield Accelerator uh, Cyclones. They will shred uh, those Void Rays. But if the Void Rays can manage to get on top of the Cyclones, it goes the other way. It is They, they both melt each other extremely fast. And, and Well, for now, neither player able to really get that, uh, that big punch. Oh, and there comes the Lock-On coming down. Oh my god, and we're going to see three Void Rays go down without really even firing a shot. That is exactly what Foodworks was looking for. Yeah, and Ice Sword here, he has not really, he has not been able to build this extremely effective army that he has been looking for. I mean, he's, his bank isn't even all that big, it's just the, what he's looking for is very expensive. He's on 44 workers, has not really been doing a great job of rebuilding his workers as he loses them. Okay, so this medevac should probably go down, but now we have mute. It's Mutiling Bane versus Battle Mech, and that is, this is a style that has been popular for a little bit of time. And look, this, this Battle Mech army will go down, but of course there is more where that came from. Foodworks, that was just the tip of the spear. That was just a coup de I'm quoting the, uh, the, the cinematic on it right, but anyway, now the army will stim on in and uh, go past the scanner, but there are two probes here. It's not a whole lot to kill. I mean, two probes is better than zero probes, but we are going to see these mutas start to go to work on this mineral line of food works. And there's not really anything in position. There we go. Uh, some Marines will stim back here, but that was a lot of workers that just got picked off. That was, what, 14 workers? Damn, great right. find right here. And he's going to continue to get more as, of course, the glaives are going to bounce off and kill things and uh, kill things and kill things and kill things. But, of course, now we have Battle Mech coming on in once again. And now Madfus, his army is there. It is powerful. It is strong. But look at this. There are not a ton of Cyclones here anymore. And that means these Void Rays are large. They are powerful. They are in charge. Now the Mutas are going to find them as well. But that just means Lock-Ons, which mean dead Mutas. That being said, though, there are a lot of Mutas on the map right now. Suddenly 13 are here. And this is something that you often actually see. Uh, when you're looking at this in 2v2, you'll see players say, hey, look, you know what? I think mutas are really powerful. If I can get a lot of them really early, it's going to be really good from a map control perspective. So the higher levels of 2v2, we do see, um, when you see uh, PZ as a style, you do see the Protoss player often just feed a ton of gas to the Zerg right when they get mutas out. 
so they can get a big Muta Force. But that's not exactly what's happened here. Now we have tanks are going to siege up Balamex. And now oh, there we go. So <laughs> no mailings will make any connections. Ooh. It looks like one will, but that's not going to be enough here. And now the Marines, they're going to stim on forward on top of everything. The Voidaries are trying to do what they can, but that is not enough here as this third base will absolutely go down for here from Janitor Bob. And more and more Voidaries, they're going to rally on him, but it is not enough. They're just going to get targeted down here. What do we have left here for these two players? Just some Mutas and some Mutas against 1-1 one, one stimmed bio. Well, that is not a fight that they want to take whatsoever here. The third base of the Zerg will go down, and GG, we're going to game five. Great moves out of the double Terran squad right there, able to do exactly what they needed to do, and uh, will force that ace match. I talked a little bit about it in the pregame that Dradition really was that 2v2 whiz, and, uh, well, we didn't see it in the fourth game, but in the third game, able to uh, make it happen, and I, I think that uh, based on what they've described before, probably had a little bit to do with the game plan in game number uh, game number four as well. So going to be really curious to see what the uh, the two ace players are here. Well, I can tell you one of them. It's going to be full heart for uh, Weenie Head Junior StarCraft team at George Mason University. And uh, you know what? I actually don't know who we see uh, from UCSD. Because, I mean, look, you have... I don't know who's available, actually. Look, is Flume here? Is Flume actually in the in the thing? I am not sure, but he would be a... If they can't uh, access Vindicta, he would be a great choice for the uh, the ace player. He is not in uh, the chat, but he would, be a, he would be a great option for UCSD. One of the... I would say the second best player on the team here. Yeah, there we go. So, ace map will be on submarine. Um, let's see whether the players have input, and I can kind of refresh the thing and see what's up. Ace player, ace player. I don't think Not so yet. just yet. <clears throat> no, I mean uh, we know it's gonna be we know it's gonna be full heart for the, yeah. the weenie huts, but you know, we have to see what the other player is going for. I, it could be T Dragon, I guess. Yeah, very possible. Uh, could be tradition once again. I don't yeah. know, though. I mean, tradition is a dominant force in 2v2, but he's not... In, I mean, he's good, but he's not incredible in 2v1. Uh, so it looks like they're just going to announce on three, basically. <laughs> 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 full, full heart with the immediate full heart uh right on go and uh we have t-dragon announcing that it's gonna be a mad fuss here uh the player we just saw stomp his way to a 2v2 victory and well on paper this this is looking like a bit of a tough match for mad fuss yeah, I mean, in end of 2020, uh, Matt Fist was a Matt was in Masters, Masters three, and now he's in uh, Diamond. So not a terrible player. I mean, certainly better than 95 percent, 92 percent of the playing population. But again, you got to remember, Full Heart, he's a semi pro. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is quite a good <laughs> wait. player. Standard, I'm saying, wait, I want to play. <laughs> One second, let me at him. So it may not be Matt Fist. Who knows? Um. <laughs> Oh well, Janitor Bob is for uh, Janitor Bob is for the. No, you're right. Weenie Hut. Weenie, Weenie Hut Junior is a StarCraft. The Weenie Hut Junior StarCraft team at George Mason. <laughs> <laughs> I will never tire. I will never tire of that. In fact, you know, Sedfest, we just got to cast the George Mason team. You know what? Here's what we're gonna do. Entire collegiate season, we're just gonna follow the Weenie Hut uh, Juniors uh, StarCraft team at George Mason, and that means we're gonna be able to see every other team that plays as well because hey, it's uh, I believe it's Round Robin. For the full season I may not be totally correct on that one but anyway that's a good way to see every other team that plays and also just get really good at talking about weenie hut jr starcraft team yeah 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 yeah. it's uh it's gonna be it's gonna be really cool to see what they can produce from the weenie hut you know what actually it's kind of funny though so um at, at uh, vcu virginia commonwealth university uh i used to do a bunch of robotics competitions down there back growing up and uh at the seagull center the basketball arena and right next to that basketball arena they had a really good like gourmet hot dog shop they sold pierogies and all these different preparations of just these really good hot dogs 
And I never knew hot dog could be so good, but that place opened my eyes. So if you're ever in Richmond, Virginia, near VCU, there's a really good hot dog place. Sounds good. Uh, we'll have to get his name after we introduce these players. Spotting down in the bottom right, the ace of George Mace. It is Exxon's full heart taste. <laughs> that didn't, nope. And the upper left in the red, looking to get the V for UCSD. He is Mathis. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> we La laughs weakly. <laughs> uh, have you ever uh. just wanted to like, um, wanted to just add that uh, that like suffix suffix to a sentence, like, oh my god, Protoss is so broken. Void rays need to be nerfed. Laughed the Zerg. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say that's a suffix, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, it, no, there's were... a specific name for it. What do you know? What it might be? Uh oh, I want to say in a positive, but it's not in a positive. Um, it begins with an A. I can't remember. Um, I thought you were gonna say steadfast. Have you ever said something and just wanted to take back anything you've ever, everything you've ever said in your life? And I absolutely understand that one. But uh, it looks like Steadfast, you're a little bit more, more confident in what you say than I am. So, never mind. I was about already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, wait. Never mind. No, never I've mind. definitely had those uh, those situations where, like, you say something and then it happens. And then 11 years pass and you're lying in bed and you're like, I can't believe I said that. Oh, what is wrong with me? And it's like, like the rational part of your brain is like that was 11 years ago dude no one remembers that but then the active part of your brain is like yeah they do they know exactly what happened don't you don't you sass me don't you gaslight me they remember oh no <laughs> the worst iteration for that for me i was at a stay away camp when i was like 12. it was like the first time i'd ever gone and like stayed for a week at a summer camp and um I was there was this girl that I was kind of tangentially friends with, and it was hot out like then. Darby, I'm like, and I keep turning. I'm like, I'm hot. Are you hot? And she's like, Philip, you don't ask your girl that. And I'm like, and I do it again because I'm you know not paying any attention. I'm like, oh, it's hot out. Are you hot? I'm hot. Are you hot? And uh, I did that the entire week. And <laughs> no, I was 12. I had no interest in her whatsoever. But I guess she took it to be the case. And it was just really awkward the entire week, and I never saw her again. But. <laughs> If you ever ask, don't ever ask, don't ever tell, uh, talk to a girl, I'm hot. Are you hot? Because apparently that is, uh, that's a problem. I don't, I think she was looking into it too much. I think you're okay on that one. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, I'm probably good too, but it's how people read it, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. No, no, definitely. <laughs> and, and especially as a kid, when all yeah. those hormones are just being weird and awful. Uh, nice pickoff here on the SCV from Matt Fuss. Uh... Yeah, good job for my full heart. But uh, yeah, a little bit of a mistake there, leaving it hanging, I guess. Uh, we are seeing this 1-1-1 one, one, one setup and ooh, quick overlord speed from full heart. He seems to seems to love his scouty majigs. Yeah, but anyway, to put a pin in that story, the awkward thing was not what I was saying one, once or twice. It was that I said it, I must have said it like 15 times over the course of the week because apparently I got stuck in that mental rut. Oh, okay. And, so you were just uh, you were asserting your dominance. Every time. <laughs> I was T-posing on or something. <laughs> that, that's, that's what the kids do now, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man but that... back to this game a little bit it does make sense that full heart <laughs> is going for overlord speed here because hey look he has got to be absolutely favored in the favored in this matchup but this is a good terran map and you know we've seen look we saw a gold player beat a master masters or diamond player last season strictly because of good preparation because of having a good build that caught the player off guard so how do you make sure you're not a cut off guard you get overlord speed you put your overlords into the natural you say i know everything that it is to know about you I know where you were born. I know where you went to elementary school. I know what you I know what you got on your third report card in your fifth year of schooling. And I know exactly what you're building in this game. I know what you did last summer. I know uh, your favorite type type of pasta. I know you know, there's just so many things to find out with Overlord Speed. Uh, specifically that pasta one. That's a really, really important one in a game of StarCraft. Uh, I mean, you ever just, you you ever just say a sentence and don't know where it's going? That was me just now. <laughs> Absolutely. But you got you to gotta imagine here, of course, with how Rain, how good Rainer has been and how outspoken uh, he is about, you know, his uh, his Italian. I mean, he's Italian, but how outspoken he's about, Ita about Italian food. Well, you've got to imagine with how good he is and how dominant he has been as a Zerg player, the overlords would have learned a lot about pasta. 
the Overmines, uh, the Three Braids, but have learned a ton about Pasta over the last several years. So now, of course, they'll be able to be excellent connoisseurs of the Pasta. Now, nice pick off from these Hellions, but that was not cheap. 23 no. Zerglings and a Queen have die died as a result of that. So Matfus, not I know he doesn't have any map control anymore, but he does have his third base just about done here. We should not see a counter punch that will cancel that third base. One one is going to get started here soon as well, and full and Matfus is actually in a rather good position to move on into the mid game. Now I would like to maybe see. Well, actually, never mind. The SCV counts doing pretty fine as well. It's funny. I'm so used to looking at Zerg SCV counts. And I'm like, ah, he's only on 40 workers. This is terrible. And I'm like, okay, it's a Terran. He's got mules and he's just been producing. It's fine. Don't worry about it, Bale. But anyway, third base now done. One one now on the way. Stim. More close to being done than not done. Madfuss just getting in a wonderful, wonderful position to play the mid-game. So the next question we must ask ourselves steadfast is where does he go from here? Will we see just eight racks continued aggression because this is submarine? Or is he going to try to take it even later? Um, That is a good question. That eight racks build is incredibly powerful on this map. I will say, though, that uh, Fullheart is in a really, really solid position in this game. Uh, he continues to Overlord Scout. He's seen that Matfus has not yet added on additional production. Uh, he's seen that the third base has not yet been landed. And he's already on 60 drones. Uh, he's just going to be going for a, a very, very heavy unit style right now. He's he's cut at 60 workers. Uh, he's getting 1-1. One, one, he's getting Bane Speed. And I think he's going to be going for a bit of an army crush situation where he just tries to uh just tries to get a really really great fight against his opponent whenever Matfus does move out and you know actually it's kind of funny there the way the terran deals with that because this is a similar idea that you do see uh protoss players do on occasion where they say okay the terran's going to be aggressive now what i'm going to go do is i'm going to get three gas i'm going to get a bunch of charge lots i'm going to swallow them whole when they first do show up now what the what the terrans that are successful against that do they just don't attack they get them to 170, 50, 170 supply, and that's when they do things. It's what in the world is that tank doing? <laughs> <laughs> I do not um, know. <laughs> now, bailing speed is not yet done, so if the tanks can target these bailings, that's going to be really nice. Ooh. Look at that targeting. All the bailings go down. And yes, this little expeditionary force will go down, as will the tank, which is not ideal. But Matfis is going for two tank, uh, for double factory production here in this game number five. And that is this for uh, enhanced widow mine production so there's actually going to be a spire on the way and more and more drones because uh full art he crushed the first move out he's now in a good position uh yeah despite despite the fact that he was so well prepared for that uh Matfus did trade a little bit better than he probably should have uh he uh full heart fought without one one without bane speed in a really really great position for Matfus. but we saw based on how that early game went and how full heart was so prepared for his opponent's move out that he just absolutely uh, even despite all those disadvantages, still just crushed through. And, well, now he's got 2-2 on the way. Uh, he's got a Spire on the way. Great scan from Matfus. We'll see that. But, realistically, Fullheart is really, really in the driver's seat right now. Absolutely. And Matfus, he's not interested in trying to go kill his opponent right now. Now, a nice scan from Fullheart, or excuse me, from Matfus, did reveal that this will be Mutatech. This will be a Spire coming on, uh, coming on out here. So we do see multiple missile turrets in every mineral line as he looks to make sure that he does not take tremendous damage from these mutas. And now we do have Widow Mines coming on as well as Drilling Claws. So, I mean, that's kind of the uh, the dichotomy there, right? When you look at it, when it, your opponent is going Hydrilling Bane, you get a lot of tanks. It does really well. When your opponent's going Mutiling Bane, you go lots of Widow Mines. That's just kind of how the two things go. And considering there are, of course, two factors on the map, that is potentially three Widow Mines at a time, which rapidly gets into the, this position where... The Zerg does not really want to take the fight because there's just so many Widow Mines. That being said, though, Fullheart, he's got a massive supply lead at this point. He's up 50 total supply just from his macro macro ability because he's a one, he's an excellent player. There we go. Infestation Pit on the way as well, and he's just progressing from strength to strength. Now, these Mutas do have to be careful, but they're not really going to... He shouldn't lose any of them, not if he's on top of things. And we're, gonna, we're going to have to see where Matt Fisk goes from here. Yeah, he's going to have to identify that that Hive is on the way. Uh, despite a little bit of creep being cleared out earlier, Fullheart does still have pretty good creep spread on the map. Ooh, nice job for Matfus. He is going to find this uh, attempted Ling counterattack from earlier. Uh, mostly he was just looking to clear out that Overlord, but that's that's still a really great find. And as well, he's got 2-2 two -two finishing up. I uh, would love to see him go straight up into that 3-3. As you did mention that he is really angling towards the late game here. 
Uh, Munis, they're actually going to be able to take the fight against these Marines. They a little bit overstimmed right there and no medevac support. And that means this uh, fourth base is a little bit kind of isolated. And yes, yeah, yes. we only have four medevacs on the map right now. Two more are on the way, but do we lose a bunch somewhere? No, I not a single. He's only built four medevacs, which so. of course yeah. this game. Now there are six, but that is uh, not a lot of medevacs. That is rather surprising. And look at this. Full Hardy says, okay, your army's going to be over there. Well, my army's going to be over here, and I'm going to do a whole lot more damage than you will because the map is short, and now the the, uh, the orbital will get lifted, but 23 oh, workers go down, and this is the this is the fight. This is what Full Hardy was looking for. Just that one hammer below, 23 workers go down. He's now in a wonderful position. Uh, that he is. That was a, a really, really strong move. And now he might be able to snipe off a Widow Mine here. Nice job. Good micro from Full Heart. And, and he is uh, he is maxed out at the moment. He's got his Hive done. And he's going to start to go to work on some of the SCVs at this newest base. He's already killed off 26 during that big run by. And, well, Madfuss is in a lot of trouble right now. Now, the one thing that Matt Fist does have going for him notionally is the fact that his army supply is roughly even to his opponents at this point. Now, that being said, though, a big start coming on in. The units are going to get on top of this fourth base, and actually it's going to be doing a really good job of... Oh, no, oh, the units are going to no. find... Oh, oh. Oof. Nice quick burr from those Widowmines. We'll keep everything alive. But as I was saying, full-on surround. Mutas will find a lot of these. Oh, that's a nice Widowmine shot. And look at that. The Marines, they're going to try to take the fight they can, but there are just too many Zerglings, too many Banelings too many mutas too much of everything here and full heart yeah he only has army supply parity for the moment but look at that bank he's caught coming on in 16 more mutas on the way if that's not a that's not that's not a display of dominance i don't know what is yeah you no know, that is uh that is a big commitment to mid-game units when he does have that hive finished up i actually think i would really prefer have preferred to see like a, a sooner ultra cat switch but uh well now he's actually gonna lose this newest base because he doesn't have enough units on the map i don't believe and even a couple of mutas getting picked off right there. So this is actually a, a little bit of progress here for Matfus. Really does need to target fire down that hatchery. But uh, still, Full Heart is going to get the counterattack damage done here. He should be able to pick off this planetary. Oh, it's dropping so low and it will go down. So uh, ends up actually working out, I would say, a little bit better there. And picks off three medevacs as well, which is a huge, huge pickoff. Yeah, considering... Well, at certain points, there are only four medevacs that have been built in this game. Considering how slow the production of medevacs has been for Matfus here, um, getting those three medevacs means there's only one medevac on the map at this point, which means less maneuverability on the map, less healing. And when you're looking at this game where you do not have an economy, I mean, you kind of do, but you're sitting here on 47 workers, only on three bases. Your fourth base just died. You need to make sure that your units are as efficient as possible. And the Muta is killing off all these medevacs is making that not as possible. So now the meters, they're going to fly on in once again, get a lot more. And more importantly, notice they're killing the mules. Considering the economic position that our player is in in this game, the mules are so incredibly important. Now, now with Magic Fox, the Thor is going to go down in two volleys. And yes, these whistle turrets are a little bit annoying, but there are just too many mutas here. They do have plus two. So no amount of repair will keep that alive. 14 more workers go down. And Matt Fist, oh no, look at his third base. We got the entire army of, uh, our entire ground army of full heart on the right hand side. And now, well, that just means mutas are going to fly in. Will these Bailings make the connection? They're looking for... Oh, no! Oh, 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 oh. Those Widowmine shots! And meanwhile, a bunch of mutas going down in the natural. Madfoot's getting a really, really great trade there. And now Absolutely. I think he is going for it. I mean, that's what you got to do. Ten more mutas died in that exchange. Twenty-five mutas have died over the course of this game. That is a gas expense in the extreme. And we have... Steadfast, we have no Bailings on the map. We have 14 morphing, but that's just going to be about it. Is there, like, no gas on the map here? And these, this is 3-2 bio. So, yeah, the meters are going to be able to just end any chance of mining for the rest of this game. But if the Widowmine shots are good, that oh. looks like they may well be. Maybe there's... Oh, look, at, there's so many Widowmines here. But oh, will we see any friendly fire? We will not. One medevac is all that remains. As now, Madfus, he is all in on this push. The meters, they have killed the, the, the natural orbital. But now, Madfus says, this is my shot. This is my one opportunity here. As more Widowmines will go off. Oh, my God. Are you serious right now? Oh, well, that's going to be it. I, that did not even parse for half a second. I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That got me off guard so much. <laughs> because it was that was actually a push that looked like it could have maybe ended the game in favor of Madfuss. And then that overlord killed off like 20 marines. <laughs> 
I'm, yeah, that did not, that did not click at three more whatsoever. I saw them. I'm like, oh, that's a lot of particles around a dead overlord. Okay, it's fine. And then you yell, I'm like, oh my God, all the Marines are dead. What happened? And oh my God. Now the Weenie Hut Jr. StarCraft team is the champion, uh, is the winner in this uh, preseason match that matters for nothing other than bragging rights. But clearly we now know which team or which school has the best Weenie Hut. <laughs> As we all suspected, it is GMU. Wow. That overlord was definitely the weenie hut for sure. That is that is the guy who stays late. He pulls overtime shift. He's he's working 13 hours at the weenie hut to make sure that is successful. That was a that was a game changing overlord right there. Absolutely, he he he's the kind of guy that goes on in and feeds the stray widow mines the leftover the leftover weenies to make sure that when the time comes, they know what they must do. <laughs> and. uh <laughs> That's how things happened. Oh, my God. That was amazing. Uh, and I think that's going to wrap things up here for our broadcast. What an explosive and amazing way to end things uh, in this, uh, well, in this uh, pre opening preseason show, show match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between uh, these two teams. Uh, what are, <laughs> well, what are your thoughts going coming on out of this, I should say? <sighs> Well, I do think we did see UCSD not at their full strength, and Matfest was surprisingly good against Full Heart. Yes, he lost, and yes, he was just kind of slipping throughout the entire game, but he had a shot to win at the end of the game, and that is not something many players can say about playing against the GM, especially when uh, Matfest, I believe, is kind of maxed out at, like, Masters 3 Diamond. So, yeah, Diamond 1, Masters 3, something like that. So that is a wonderful accomplishment for him. He played really damn well. And, yeah. uh... I'm just excited to see how this season goes. We have more teams in the collegiate division, as we mentioned earlier, than ever before. Rice University has a team. George Mason has a team. Uh, Utah Valley, who looked so good uh, in the uh, in the previous season, they have two teams now. So with all that being said, we're going to have a lot more collegiate action, a lot more corporate action as well. And it's just a wonderful time to be a StarCraft fan of the CEA. I cannot wait to see where, where we go on over the next however many weeks are in this season. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it <laughs> is going to be uh, a lot of fun. I, I really think the 2v2s adds so much to everything. And I can't wait uh, to see that shape out throughout shape up throughout the season. Uh, now, before we sign off here, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where the good people can find you? Well, that's an interesting question, Sadfast, because I am literally all over the place. But uh, first and foremost, I stream on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Beowulf. Um, I also stream on Trovo occasionally on a couple different things. It's not really worth mentioning because here's the big deal. I'm on Twitter, Beowulf, at Beowulf underscore SC2. I will always tweet where and when I'm going live, even if I forgot to do that. That's fine. I didn't forget to do it today because I'm, we're, of course, this broadcast will, be, will premiere today, which is tomorrow on Sunday. There we go. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm always going to tweet where and when I'm going live. So if you're trying to follow me, just follow me on Twitter. I'm on Trovo. I'm on Afrika. I'm on... I cast for the Alpha X channel. I cast for the Axon channel. I cast for a pizza pie. It's all over the place. Just follow me on Twitter. Beowulf underscore SC2. But how about you, Steadfast? Where can the good folks find you? Well, uh, you can find me in a good number of places as well. Uh, you can find me on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash SC, uh, which is actually just below the stuff. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash SC2. Uh, you can find me here uh, every week throughout the season alongside Beowulf, uh, twitch.tv slash CEA. By the way, make sure to follow these guys. These guys are putting in absolute work. They're covering uh, a whole bunch of games this season. Overwatch, Valorant, StarCraft 2, obviously. Uh, they just added chess. Uh, some some really great stuff. They Everything's for charity. They're, they're really awesome people. Uh, make sure to show them some love on Twitter, on the account, on Twitch. Uh, check out their other games if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, best place to find me is probably Twitter as well. Uh, I guess you can join my Discord as well, but you can go through my Twitch channel for that. Other than that, I think that's going to wrap things up for us for the day. And I am looking forward for the uh, regular season to begin. Unfortunately, I won't be joined by Beowulf next week, but it is going to be, it's going to be awesome regardless. That it will be. So, yeah, Steadfast, you're going to be all on your lonesome next week. Hope you can manage without my uh, charming personality and absolute lack of game knowledge. 
but it's fine. It's going to be dandy because I'll be back with you for week two and then onwards. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It's been some great games. We saw some great games here in this collegiate division. Stay safe out there, everyone.